Shane read for us from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is a, it, it almost appears like it's two passages or two different uh, uh, or even more uh, kinds of uh, contexts that are being offered here by uh, Solomon, but it really all kind of ties together. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, in Luke chapter 18, in verse 10, Jesus tells a parable uh, about two men who went to the temple to pray. And I think many of you are probably already familiar with that. Parable. One was a Pharisee, says Jesus. The other was a tax collector, which in those days would have uh, translated into a used car salesman or a preacher today. Anyway, the Pharisee stood by himself in verse 11 and pompously prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like uh, other 
people, robbers, evildoers, or adulterers, or even this tax collector, I'm sure he motioned over to him. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. So this guy's rather proud of himself. Meanwhile, the tax collector uh, stood off at a distance, says Jesus, beating his chest, too afraid to lift his eyes up into heaven. God have mercy on me, a sinner, he cries out. Quite a contrast. Jesus says in verse 14, that surprisingly enough, it was the, the self-confessing tax collector, not the self-righteous Pharisee, who went away justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, says Jesus, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The book of Ecclesiastes is really a curious peek into the harsh reality of life on earth, or as Solomon calls it, uh, life under the sun. Whether it's youth or old age, pleasure or pain, Life without God is but dust if all we can reasonably look forward to is death. And while certainly arguments can be made, and I've heard these for uh, happy days in this life with or without God, I mean, there are fulfilling aspects of it, uh, things like family, hobbies, recreation, career, and so on. But the truth is, it's all momentary at best, and no one escapes the inevitable finality of death. I've done funerals. I tell you, all the stuff you did when you were uh, when you were alive it just kind of comes to a screeching halt. Now, in chapter five, the teacher turns his focus to superficial religion and exposes the godless worship of people for what it is—the meaningless sacrifice of fools. Now, as I said, Shane read for us Solomon's lesson in chapter five, and it begins with his warning in verse one to guard your steps when entering the house of God. In Jesus' parable, you will remember that the Pharisee carelessly paraded himself into the temple as though he were doing God a favor by simply showing up. And such a pretentious attitude certainly has no place before God, who presumably holds the universe in his hands. Then in verse 2, Solomon warns us not to be quick with our mouths, which he says comes from a hasty heart. The Hebrew word translated hasty in the, in the New International Version describes someone more concerned with telling God what's on their mind rather than being interested in what's on God's mind. Finally, in verse 7, Solomon concludes by simply saying, therefore, fear God. Pharisee in Jesus' day didn't fear God as much as he feared being confused with this sinful tax collector. And so based on Solomon's lesson, we can conclude that if we don't guard our steps, hold our tongues, and lack a proper fear of God, we're likely to be offering what Ecclesiastes and all its wisdom calls the sacrifice of fools. Some of you may recall that song we used to sing in Sunday school, I think it was Sunday school, that we used to sing growing up, uh, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear, for the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful little mouth what you say. I'm sure I heard that song, I had that song sung to me more than once. But Solomon seems to be saying, the same thing in this passage, but with an adult twist. The New Living Bible paraphrases verse 1 to read, As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. And most of us are, attempt, are tempted, and I'm come, this is coming from my own personal experience, to mindlessly blab our way in and out of God's presence as though he owed us a daily audience. The Pharisee and Jesus' story was of a mind that God had been waiting to hear especially from him. And yet Solomon's command is to guard your steps when entering God's house, literally meaning we're to watch where we're going as we anticipate our worship or our interaction with God. Evidently, we should proceed with cautious reverence rather than self-righteous pride when entering God's house, which, of course, is a house of prayer. When I was a kid, I remember we didn't dare go to church in anything that wasn't our very best. Close you notice I started wearing a tie. I told somebody, yeah, this is Nathan 2.0. Um, <laughs> trying to be more pastoral. Uh, uh, I, and evidently, since I can't quit sinning, I'll wear a tie, and maybe that'll fool you. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, when I was a kid, like, you, you, you wore your very best clothes, I remember, especially Easter time. And you got new clothes, and it was all a big deal. And maybe you were called dressing up. Uh, as they say, to attend Sunday school and church. We weren't allowed to play in or around uh, the sanctuary, the, uh, you know, the chapel where we meet to worship, and we usually spoke with hushed voices 
especially when church was about to start. And while I'm certainly not implying in any way that uh, we're holier, that we were holier in those days than, in, than Christians are today, it does seem as though we've lost a little bit of touch with some of the more tangible aspects of our honor and respect for worship. Well, I understand that, that singing to God is a celebration of His glory and raising hands indicates we're unashamed to praise Him. I love all that kind of stuff. Worship also is a somber challenge to thoughtfully consider who God is and what He's done for His people. In more recent times, we've rightly emphasized that God is our friend and comforter but we've also minimized, I think, wrongly in many cases, the fact that our friend in heaven is also the creator God, whose kindness, forbearance, and patience are intended, according to Romans chapter 2, verse, or chapter 1, verse 2, to, excuse me, 2, verse 1, to lead to our repentance. According to Ecclesiastes and a number of other biblical texts, God is in heaven and we're on earth. So, based on that perspective, we really ought to act like it when it comes to our worship. You may recall the story of, of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where he inst he's instructed by God to completely wipe out the evil Amalekites. Uh, however, as the story goes, the foolish king openly disobeyed God and he kept back some of the sheep and cattle for himself. Now, of course, a lot of people have concluded that God's a bloodthirsty monster who slaughters innocent people. Uh, when uh, you know, the, the guilt, the uh, innocent along with the guilt. But that's not what this says. What, would, what, it, what it means is, is that when God says kill everything, it means everything, not just the stuff that the king doesn't want for himself. Anyway, when Samuel finally arrives and, and sees that Saul had disobeyed God, he promptly denounces the king. And what's more, Saul lies and says that he had kept back the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to God, which he had not. So Samuel says in verse 23, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in listening to him and obeying his voice? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. To hear is better than to, to hear and obey is better than any sacrifice. In other words, Saul doesn't ex expect Saul doesn't expect God to our gut doesn't expect Saul doesn't expect God anyway it was the, <laughs> well, sorry about that I, I got uh, that that was the sacrifice of a fool right there anyway, like King Saul in the second in, in the book of Samuel and the Pharisee in Jesus parable a fool thinks that he can somehow manipulate God to bless them with what appears to be acts of pious religiosity while actually at the same time ignoring the Lord's command. But the truly wise person knows that the worship of God occurs when we submit to His will by means of faithful obedience and do precisely as He has instructed us to do. Otherwise, we're doing nothing but again offering the sacrifice of a fool. After graduating from seminary back in 1986, and I know that sounds like forever, but uh, I remember my dad telling me, Nathan, you're a pastor now. It's very important uh, that you try very hard to remain silent uh, and, uh, and be thought uh, maybe ignorant, if, if, if necessary, by others than to speak up and remove all doubt. <laughs> the New Living Bible translates verse 3 to read, Just as being too busy gives you nightmares, so being a fool makes you a blabbermouth. That's downright Freudian when you think about it. Besides, trying to do too much at once or talking all the time, I guess, evidently leads to nightmares. So after telling his readers to guard their steps and to carefully watch themselves in the worship of God, Solomon adds in verse 2, don't be quick with your mouth, and don't be hasty in your heart. The supreme act of foolishness is demonstrated by the Pharisees in Jesus, the Pharisee rather, in Jesus' story, is to presume that we're somehow in a position to thoughtlessly direct our conversations toward God without any consideration towards what he may want to hear from us. As though, he, as though he's expected to just listen to whatever it is that we have to say whenever we feel like saying it. Although Solomon might agree that God doesn't reject or, or even criticize our thoughts and prayers necessarily, he does contend that we have, we have little to offer the Lord in terms of our own religious advice. When it comes to our relationship to God, and this begins with me as well as anyone else, 
there's simply no room for self-importance. The latter part of verse, in the latter part of verse 2, Solomon reminds us that God is in heaven, that we're on earth, so let your words be few. To state such an obvious fact may sound almost redundant, and yet how many times have we thoughtlessly dominated our conversations with God as though we were the deity and he was the disciple? The book of James says in chapter 1, verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Then later in the, th the third chapter of James, he writes in verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. No human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Roger Babson was a highly successful businessman who founded the now famous Babson College in, in uh, Massachusetts. It's a college for entrepreneurs and people who are go on to start businesses and so on. Anyway, he was visiting Argentina one time. He visited with the president of Argentina. And he asked the, uh, the, the, the president asked the famous millionaire why it was that South America, with all of its unlimited resources, and having been settled actually earlier than North America or United States and Canada, why it has nevertheless made such slower progress in civilization and material prosperity. And Babis, Babson famously threw the question back at the president of Argentina. He said, Mr. President, you've evidently studied this question yourself. And I would be interested in what you've discovered. And the president of Argentina said that while South America was settled by Spaniards who were seeking gold, North America was settled by pilgrims seeking God. For four solid chapters, Solomon has declared the ultimate emptiness, emptiness of things like work, wisdom, and pleasure as nothing but dust without the worship of God. Despite the human ambition to succeed, the teacher describes work as meaningless without God. Even in a world nearly obsessed with experiencing pleasure over pain, Solomon says pleasure isn't all it's cracked up to be without the worship of God. So we might as well face it, words without wisdom, just like life without worship, is the sacrifice of fools. If the mind can't achieve lasting wisdom, and if the body can't endure death, then what's the point of it all anyway? I mean, if work is futile and pleasure is ultimately meaningless by itself, then there's, well, what's, what is the purpose of life? What's it all supposed to mean in the end? If you look at verse 7, Solomon gives the answer to this very question. And what's more, he tells us what's life supposed to mean. He says it rather abruptly. Therefore, fear God. That seems kind of odd. As a matter of fact, in chapter 12, Solomon summarizes the entire book of Ecclesiastes by saying in verse 13, Now all has been said and heard. Here's the conclusion. Literally in the Hebrew it reads, The dust is settled. Here's what you see. Fear God and keep his commandments. But this is the duty of all mankind. I know that sounds a bit oversimplified, but that's exactly what Solomon says. And he's obviously right about these things. He's challenging his readers to recognize that by fearing God more than fearing anything or anyone else, we'll achieve a meaningful life worthy of every, our every sacrifice. Our work will become more satisfying. Our wisdom will become more wise. And even our pleasures will become more pleasurable when we learn to fear God more than anything or anyone else. The fear of God is one of those biblical ideas that most of us struggle with. I know I have, maybe you have as well. Yet when you think about it, fear explains much about it, as much about our human motivation as anything else. Theologian Roger, Roger, Robert Strimple described the fear of God as the convergence of awe, reverence, and yes, fear. In Exodus chapter 20, when God descends down to Mount Sinai to give Moses the Ten Commandments in verse 20, Moses says to God's people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that, you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. It almost sounds contradictory. The NIV does an excellent job of translating really a very difficult Hebrew expression where God is both to be feared for exposing our sins and yet embraced for accepting our repentance as the cure for those sins. The truth is this. If our fear of God isn't more than our fear of things like death, monsters, taxes, and bosses, 
And we're going to lose our faith to, to the things that we fear, to, to the things that we fear the most. In all honesty, if that were the end of this passage, then I'd be good with it. I'd pretty much, uh, that's what I wanted to, I guess, pick up on. But there's more in verses 4 through 7. You see in these verses, Solomon illustrates his point about make, making foolish sacrifices. When you make a vow to God, he says in verse 4, don't delay in fulfilling it. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake, he says in verse 6. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? In other words, being obedient to God is tough enough without making unnecessary promises you may or may not be able to keep. So keep it at a minimum. Just go with what God enables you to do and keep your mouth shut about how great you think you are. The fear of God and, and the obedience that it requires is what makes for a disciple. Every time we fear God enough to fulfill his expectation for our lives, we draw closer to him. Conversely, when we fear something or, or someone more than we fear God, that's called sin. And we drift away from it further and further. And thus, the answer to life's probing need for meaningfulness isn't to make religious promises that we can't keep, but to fear God and keep His commandments. An old American Indian chief was telling a, a gathering of young braves about the soul's struggle within. It's like two dogs fighting inside of us, he said. There's one good dog and who wants to do what's right, and there's one bad dog who wants to do what's wrong. And sometimes the good dog is stronger and wins the fight, but sometimes the bad dog is stronger. The young braves listened carefully to the wise old chief, and finally one of them asked, which dog is going to win in the end? And the old chief answered, of the dog you feed. Allow me to close by reading Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector again. In this story, Jesus essentially draws the conclusion between, the, or draws the distinction rather, between the authentic worship of God and what Solomon calls the sacrifice of fools. Two men went to the temple to pray, he said. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he dared not even lift his eyes, says Jesus, to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful for me, I am a sinner. Amen. I tell you, that this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Psalm 51, <coughs> verse 17 says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise. If you would stand for the prayer. Lord, it is uh, good to be in your house. And it's good to worship with your people. We also realize, Lord, that there's more to this than just uh, the good intentions of people who desire to do the right thing. There's also the, the need that we have to be nourished by your word, to be strengthened by one another's company and the fellowship that we have together. These are trying times and difficult times to uh, be able to you know, do either one or even especially both. But these folks have gathered here together this day uh, and uh, I've asked your blessings upon them. Ask that you would keep us mindful of the importance of our worship and the importance of our giving to you not only ourselves in worship but ourselves in obedience to your every word as you've instructed us. For we pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you guys for being here this morning. I have a couple of announcements I want to announce about. As Nathan hit upon um, this morning about next week, we're starting Sunday school at 9 o'clock. We'll have all the children's departments, we'll have um, the youth, we'll have the adults. Um, and so please make plans to come. That starts at 9 a.m. next Sunday. While we were out for the seven months that before we, you know, we got together and we discussed what we thought was 
the most helpful for our church family. And we felt like Bible study was it. So um, we also have Bible studies starting up in um, November. We're going to have two women's Bible studies. We will continue with the Thursday night women's Bible study that will meet at 7 o'clock over here in the um, cafe area. And um, they will have that group still going at 7 o'clock. We're also starting another women's group that will be on Tuesday night at 6.30 at um, the Gowness House. And their address is in the phone book, and you'll probably forget, but it's 1609 Dole my court. Um, please, the men also start that same Thursday night, which was, I think, the 5th, November 5th. And they will be over here at the church also at 7 o'clock. And um, see Sunny if you're interested, or if, if you just think, well, what are you guys going to do? Or talk to me, talk to Emily or Rose. Rose's not here tonight, but today. But, Talk to us and see, because we we can make space for you with the six feet apart and with masks and all the things that um, the state is requiring of us. But we really feel that that Bible study is so important. And if you have a youth age someone that you want to come, come talk to me and we can send a, a invite to them. Or if you have a friend you want to bring to Bible study, fine. The Tuesday night that I'm going to have at um, Jeanette's house is on the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe the one the Thursday night is Craig, that we have something inside of us that craves God. And and how do you discern that? And so talk to Emily and, and Rose. Talk to me. We would love to see you at our Bible study. And, and make plans. Talk to us. And, and hope to see you soon. All of the information about that will also be put up on the website. And so any information um, to Calvary, um, the Sunday school and the Bible studies, pastor's always good about updating that and keeping that on the um, cbclosblindness.com. We want to continue to encourage you um, to give and support your church, and you can do that online. Um, you can click the Give button. You can pay by PayPal, I believe, and stuff like that. Or you can give uh, while you're here. But we do thank you for your support and um, continue to support your church. We have our ushers um, come forward at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this uh, day that you have given us, Lord, and the opportunity to come to your house this morning to worship you. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for your word that you have given us. Uh, let us just be able to soak it up and and obey, uh, just obey you, Lord. And we just pray that you just bless this offering and use it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Thank you. 